Welcome to episode two of Film Chats, conversations with Ottawa's film, TV, and media community, presented by Digi60 Filmmakers Festival. I'm Sampi Balamingi, a student of sociology at Carleton University and an emerging filmmaker. Over the past few months, I've sat down with some fabulous professionals here in Ottawa to talk about issues of representation in the film industry. Today, I sat down with Nathan Hall. Nathan is the CEO of Simple Story, an award-winning video marketing agency. Nathan works with brands and corporations of all sizes from around the world, helping them realize the power that video and storytelling has on their business. Please enjoy this episode with Nathan Hall. Nathan, thank you so much for joining us here today. No problem. Thank you for having me. Wonderful to have you on. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe just give me a overview of how you first got into visual storytelling. Growing up, I was really into cameras and that kind of thing. Uh, when we first got our, our first video camera, family would always make short videos and uh, sketches and, and different things of that nature. Uh, but it was never something I, I, I thought would be a, a career or anything like that. Um, and then I just kind of pursued marketing more. Um, and then as video became more and more important within marketing and as online social media and that kind of thing became more of a powerful platform. Uh, so that's kind of how I got into it as a subset of marketing. So it was just kind of pulled on a lot of past experiences from, you know, the creative realm and, um, uh, you know, desiring to be a director and all those types of things that I never took super seriously, but then on the marketing side and they, you know, they kind of converged. So here I am. Awesome. Yeah. I remember when I was a kid, I used to like set up my desktop computer and like, it'd be stationary in one place, but we'd like do little like skits right in front of it and like pull it together in iMovie. Yeah. yeah this see, I, I think I'm, I'm a little bit older than you. So I used to have to edit with the uh, VHS and so I'd, I'd plug it in the uh, the camcorder into the into the VCR, and I'd have to pause and play to kind of edit, edit things like there. So yeah, like seeing now, you know, if I had the technology and the computers to be able to edit, it would have been a, a very yeah, different it story. Like for I me. movie provided me maybe like a bit more sophisticated <laughs> yeah, technology. Yeah. Um, could you tell me a bit about your first creative project and what you learned from that project? Um, yeah, I guess probably the first big one, like I was probably more into music. Um, so like in high school, I used to make a lot of music. And uh, so like I had done an album or a couple of them. And so like wrote, produced, performed, engineered, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I was just always doing a lot um, on that front. Uh, you know, I think that that really helped shape a lot of my ideas of what was possible. Every project I did, I always tried to push myself because I, I did everything myself. So I'd always try to learn new things. So it's okay. I, that project that wasn't mixed well, I need to improve how to mix or it's like, okay, now I, I have how do I get it out there? And so learning, you know, about printing and then graphic design for the album cover and all that kind of thing. So every project, there was something that I learned about it um, from doing everything from technical to, you know, the marketing and business side of things um, and distribution and everything. So it kind of exposed me to a lot of things. So it really taught me to one, um, you know, there's nothing I can't learn. And so just putting yourself out there and then also the value of knowing everything um, from beginning to end, how valuable that is. Because when you think about the end of where you want to be when you're at the beginning, you know, it allows you to optimize kind of the path you're taking. You're not just end up doing things as, uh, oh, I'm at this point, I, I'm forced to kind of make a decision. Like from the very beginning, you know, OK, how do I want it packaged? How do I want it distributed? How do I want it marketed? And like you kind of think of all those things as you're creating them from the beginning. And I find it just it just gives you like a different perspective and you can really optimize the whole thing from the very beginning. And it's never like, oh, man, I wish I had thought of that before because you thought of everything you have that long game. I think it also, um, you know, really helped with uh, the idea of, you know, just start you don't need to have all the answers. I don't need to know how to do everything. Like when I'm writing, I don't need to know all the details of how I'm going to learn about mastering or editing at this stage, but knowing that it's like, I'm going to have to to get there, but just kind of doing things and not getting so caught up. Like, I don't know how to do this, this and that and getting so caught up in all the details and just pushing yourself out there. Uh, you know, eventually you figure it out. 
right? And so it's a lot kind of, again, something kind of taken into like the entrepreneurship and in, in business world is, you know, you're not going to have all the answers. Um, and a lot of times if you sit there and try and figure out all the answers, the opportunity has passed you, right? So it's really just diving in there. How can I just get in there? I have a little bit of an idea, a nugget of an idea, something I want to run with. Um, I don't necessarily have all the things, but just really going in to, to figure it out. Um, I think also in the creative, you know, as doing it for myself, but later on, um, I worked in a, a recording studio. So like doing like producing and, and engineering for other people. And I feel like I really uncovered a knack there of helping other people um, tell their stories and getting other people to take their, um, you know, the intangible or, or semi-formed thoughts and how do I turn that into something bigger or better or it's like take what's in your head and, and help you get it out. Um, take something that's intangible and to make it tangible. I found that that was kind of like a skill that I've taken with me everywhere that I go um, in life. Uh, is being able to do that. So whether, you know, managing other people, uh, how to get the best out of them or working with clients and, you know, they speak, you know, especially like in the, in the video, they don't have the language. They don't have like the technical understanding of a lot of things, but they know the feeling that they want or they know what the end result and all those types of things, but they don't know how to get there, right? So a lot of times it's that, how do you have that uh, conversation to get you to that point where they understand. Um, so it's how do I get into people's heads really well? And then how can I pull that out there and make it into something tangible, something that they can't hardly articulate themselves? How can I do that for them? So I think that that is a very powerful skill uh, that I've been able to use in a lot of different ways, you know? So yeah, I think I don't know if that answer I kind of went on a tangent there. No, that was great. And I think I really like this lesson that you kind of talked about of like not judging yourself and not doubting yourself and just diving in. Because I know like as an emerging filmmaker, I often like judge my work or like whether or not I'm going to be capable to like, you know, coordinate all these different components that go into filmmaking. So it's really interesting to hear like this journey of just working on projects and just yeah for like sure i think that's the most steps. important thing you can do is just yeah. take action and to learn like a lot of, like you can read all the books and watch the documentaries and like i'm the type of person who wants to make sure i have all everything figured out but it's like you know just going out there is the most important thing because you're never going to be as ready as you want to be you're never going to be as prepared or as skilled or or anything but the more you put yourself out there the more you're going to grow so much more um, by doing than just by sitting back and watching and reading and that kind of thing. So, I mean, that's, that's my advice for everyone out there. No matter what it is you want to do, just do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, like, so you started off in terms of creative endeavors, like making music. What was your path into getting into corporate storytelling and the more visual visual realm? Um, and was it like, was it linear? Was it zigzagging? Uh, I, well, I mean, in it, it didn't feel linear. And I, I would say, you know, the people around me definitely would say it was not linear. Um, to me, it's like, I always just kind of followed my passions and you know, maybe you got from those parts. It's like, I have, I have the technical stuff, kind of like a tech person. Like I always like fidgeting with the new computers. I always want to learn, you know, new technology, but then I'm also a big, uh, you know, social science, psychology, sociology, how do people work? How do societies work and systems work? I like thinking like that. Uh, but then I also love business and just kind of like the structure and um, all of that kind of thing. So I've always, you know, I was kind of chasing those things. So in school, you know, I kind of studied all of those things and people are just like, um, what are you, what are you doing? It's just like, okay, you were studying sociology and then you were studying audio engineering then you're studying business and all these things and to me it's all a part of who I am like the idea as a kid like oh what do you want to be when you grow up it's like I want to be a, a teacher or this like th that whole concept always just gave me anxiety I'm just like I just have to choose one thing um, just because I never felt like I was just interested in one thing like I liked all of these different elements so I didn't necessarily have a master plan where it's like, yeah, this is where I'm going to go. This is what it's going to end up doing. It was like, I have passion and, you know, skill sets in these areas. Let me just kind of do what they do and, and continue to enhance those. 
with each job as I got more kind of clarity and it's like, oh, these are my skill sets. Even though I kind of ran from marketing, somehow I just kept getting pushed deeper and deeper into it and seeing like, oh, all these things come together. My experiences in, in writing or my experiences in the studio, my experiences in, you know, doing my little sketches and, you know, editing things and um, doing my album art you know, gave me ex exposure to Photoshop. It gave me, you know what I mean? So it's like I had all of these random skill sets that I acquired over the years that seemed completely separate. And on linear, all of a sudden now it all converged together where it's just like I use Photoshop. I use my writing skills. I use my ability to, you know, talk to people or like to understand the psychology of people or how people work and function or how businesses function. And all of these things have kind of come together. Looking back, it's kind of like a straight path where it's just like, you know, kind of like on a quest, like a video game where it's like, I'm picking up all of these little tools. <laughs> yeah. I don't know when I'm going to need this thing or when I'm going to need that thing, but I just put it in the pouch. And now all of a sudden here I am using them. It sounds like you had like all these different competing in interests that you've managed to dovetail them into this like amazing career too. Yeah, That's I guess. Really um, yeah, I think a lot of times it was just kind of going deep on one of them so that they weren't always like in balance. So like there are some years where it's like, okay, I'm really deep into this stuff. And then um, I'm like, okay, I'm done with this. Let me go really deep. And like I have a deep dive into different things. You know, I always tell people not to get hung up on necessarily jobs. And it's like, what would you be doing? Because you never know, like as more and more careers like converge and, and come together, like there's so many skill sets that are out there that are so important no matter what you find yourself doing. It's like being able to write is always important. Or like, you know, as video becomes more prevalent in every place like you know on every team having somebody who understands video or can quickly edit a video together or you know piece these things can tell good stories these are valuable skills across all industries and in all different you know walks of life that's a really nice sentiment to hear too like this idea of valuing all your experiences like and understanding that they have worth even if they're not like relevant to you right away because like as a sociology student who also wants to go into filmmaking who also like I just feel like my like interests are so sprawled and like the different creative endeavors I want to do like I'm always just doing something different so it's nice to hear like from somebody who's done that but then who's it's like it's kind of come together in the end yeah it's I think really it's nice. so important like having that variety of experience and knowledge right it's like I love sociology because it was like you know the science of science like you're looking at everything right so it's looking at what's the impact of you know business and you know or it's it's science it's environment it's health it's public policy it's all of these things um and you know we're we're so interconnected everything is so interconnected so having those skill sets i think are so valuable the ability to research and understand things or understand the impact that one thing has on another um, and I just find like working with people who have that broader context of life, even though you have a very specific skill set in something, to have that broader context makes you so much more valuable because you see where you kind of fit in, you see how everything connects. And I just think that they come with such great perspective. So yeah, I, I always tell people like there is no wasted education. There's no, um, you know, you're not, you're not failing if you don't work in the job field that you studied for. It's, it's not, I don't consider that necessarily relevant. Um, I think having those extra experiences gives you such a stronger perspective because you're able to think differently than everybody else in that field, right? It's like when you only did business and studied finance and that, right? You don't understand. It's like, oh, what's the social implications of what this project that we're going to do? Or, you know, how is, well, what's the psychological impact that, you know, using our product is going to have, you know what I mean? It's just the, that deeper level um, that if you're only studying like a, a very specific subject, you don't get that um, in the same way, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm wondering um, what your thoughts are on how visual representation can reach people in ways that written word can't. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, they say uh, image is worth a thousand words, but r recent studies are showing that an image, the human brain processes images like 60,000 times faster than words, right? And so it's like, we see that it has such a profound 
impact on us. And when you extend that to video and you add, you know, motion and sound and music, like it's such, uh, it, con- it impacts all of your senses. So I think, you know, visuals continue to be such a powerful thing. On the business front, we see, you know, like your social ads, if you have a picture, you have a video, how much more engagement you have with these things, right? So there's, there's a monetary impact to, to the, the power of visuals, but there's also, you know, psychological and social and all these other things um, that we just yearn for these types of imageries and that kind of thing. With this, like, the importance of seeing yourself on screen, and when we elevate previously silenced voices, we bring to the fore just a broader range of stories and perspectives. So I'm wondering your thoughts on how we can ensure that these stories are getting told. We all have to be responsible for our our own stories. Um, So I think that that is really key and not to be dependent on like dominant culture to say like, oh, those stories matter. Um, Let's tell those. So I think it's really taking taking ownership and saying, okay, we need to all tell our own stories and and be the owners of them. And and that includes, again, being part of, you know, the whole uh, chain, the distribution chain. And so it's like, you need people that look like you who are writers, who are directors, who are showrunners, who are executives, who are producers, who are distributors, right? And have everyone because everyone comes with that perspective. They understand and it's not going to change that narrative along the way. So I think that's key. I think we should continue to fight to have a seat at, you know, those other tables and fight to get more people on, on those tables. But You know, we don't have to wait for people to come around and say like, okay, yeah, I see the magic of of that group's stories. Let me start telling them because then that's when, you know, miseducation happens and, you know, they want to change little things here and there. So I think there is that that ownership we need to have over our our own communities and, and sharing our stories. Also knowing what stories you can tell and what stories like you shouldn't you shouldn't tell. I think it's like an interesting dynamic um, at play currently in the film industry. Yeah. Sometimes like you have the representation and it's like, oh no, we have we have a black person or we have this or we had that story, but it's always kind of like the same story. Coming from a black perspective, like you always have those limited um, representations on the screen. Um, how, how you see yourself and it's always you know the entertainer the athlete you know what I mean and it's like you have just such like there's three or four um, roles that's like you know I always like black actors and stuff they always get pegged for those things that those are the same types of stories that always be told and then so now it's like everyone else is watching and so now they're you're being portrayed as that now because then everyone keeps seeing people that look like you are always doing these things. So then it's like, oh, you must be good at, at sports. You must be, you know, this or that just because that's always what's being seen. And then even for yourself, when you see people that look like you or who are always doing the same things, then that you internalize that where it's like, oh, that's what I should be doing, right? So it's impactful on both sides, even within the community and outside of the community. So that's why it's so important to have that diversity even within representation. So it's like you have people from all walks of life, from different perspectives, different experiences, telling different stories. Just because they don't look like you doesn't mean there's no value in you watching that movie or reading this book or that TV show. Um, so I think we're starting to see a lot more of that. But yeah, I think it's it's super important. Like I think representation is like one of the most important things. So it's like when you're growing up and like you see people who look like you doing different things and having that breadth of stuff that they do, uh, you know, it's just, it's so, it's so important. Is there anything the industry leaders are doing or that they should do to provide better support and provide better opportunities so that like all experiences can be told on screen? I think just uh, giving opportunities uh, more and more um, and just recognizing the value of these things and kind of getting out of the way. And like I said, I think it's important for everybody to kind of tell their own stories. And so not saying it's like, oh, there's a good story over there. I'm going to tell your story for you. Um, and so just giving that support. I was just reading the um, Bob Iger book. So he was the, he's the CEO of Disney. And just kind of like going through, like, as they were looking at um, the Marvel franchise and, and the whole universe, it's just like, hey, we need 
more women and people of color superheroes and just kind of like that that meeting that they had and so it's just like okay let's go find the people who can best tell those stories for for that that community um and just getting behind that and so seeing that and not trying to capitalize on it and being like okay well let's get J.J. Abrams to do Black Panther and that kind of thing um, and recognizing, you know, it's going to have such a better and, and resonate so much more by having people from those communities tell those stories. And so I think just creating that opportunity uh, to say like, hey, I want to elevate you. I want to lift your voice up. That is the most important thing I think anybody can do. And I like your comment of just and then getting out yeah, of the way yeah, I think too. Just and getting sure out of the way, not, be quiet. And yeah. I mean, we just talk about like allyship. Is you know that's the most important thing. It's just like, hey, if you're not in that community being impacted, but you have some sort of um, authority or privilege in some context, it's just like, hey, like I see you're struggling over there. I have a platform here. Use my platform. I'm standing out the way. So it's like you make the connection, but it's not me here trying to talk for you or to talk over you or to talk about you. It's just like you can talk to my people directly and just creating as much of that um, frictionless as much as I can. Like if, you know, that's uh, to me is like what true allyship is all about. It's like, hey, if you have some sort of platform or ability to help in some way, it's like you got to connect the, the people who are going through it with that, that audience. This is kind of a pivot, but still on the same yeah. thread. Um, I was wondering how you view your craft and then how you manage to combine like self-expression with a financial livelihood. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I do videos for corporate videos, so videos for businesses, explainer videos, commercials, product videos. So, I mean, and then on top of that, it's like I'm not, you know, the director or like creative lead on these. I just kind of... I mean, executive. So it's like I just help and, and connect things and, you know, uh, make sure the creative people have what they need in order to do these projects. So I, like it's not necessarily um, creating uh, art in, in my sense, where it's like business is kind of my art, the way I, I like to, that's how I see it anyway. Um, but just having that creativity. So you know, in doing sales and talking to clients, like I said, going back to those earlier years of, of producing people or being an engineer and, and trying to understand what their pain points are, how can we best solve them? Um, you know, how do we organize ourselves in order to address, you know, the problems of our clients and right. So it's the same type of problem solving, just at a, a different level or going at it in a different way. Um, it's like, okay, here's what I'm trying to capture. How do I make that happen? I need to look at budgets. I need to look at all the actors who are going to be involved. I need to look at my shot list. I need to look at my gear. And it's like, you know, all of those things still happen just at a different capacity um, than it would for like actual production. Yeah. And you're the one who built Simple Story, right? Um, like, I took it over from someone else. Yeah. And how have you found like stepping into that role? Um, yeah, it, it, it it's been good. I, I think there was there's lot there was lots of opportunities. It was kind of um, you know hurting when I when I stepped into it, and so reassessing the situation and saying like, okay, what's good about it? What needs to be improved? Where do we need to make changes? What needs to be addressed? And so just constantly, um, you know, again back to those early days, it's like, oh, here's what it could be. I need to figure out. Um, you know, what pieces I need or what resources do I have at my disposal that I can work on? What needs to be addressed right now? What can wait a couple of months? Um, and just kind of figuring all those things out, right? So again, it's not a matter of having like a clear vision of what is going to happen, but you have kind of like that vision of here's what I, I hope to have happen. Here's how I can push us to get to that point, right? These are the things that I, I need to do or these are the things within my control that I can manage um, and then just growing from there. How do we create visual storytelling that's more long lasting and durable? Uh, I, I, I don't think we can really control that. I mean, things are, are fleeting quite a bit and it's like we're just constantly, constantly inundated. Um, with things from all around and pe everything is fighting for our attention. So like that is the most scarce resource, uh, you know, that we're all trying to, 
to get a hold of. So it's like, I, I don't think like everyone's always trying to game the system. It's like, oh, how do I get them to, you know, click my Facebook ad and, and do all these types of things? Um, you know, and I just stick to the idea of just creating great content consistently um, over a period of time. And that's what that's what makes you great. And, you know, the thing is, is that it is fleeting. So you might post that video and people forget about it in in a couple of days. But with the permanency of the Internet, things can keep always come back around. So in five years from now, that video might resurge because of something else you did. And now all of a sudden it's getting all this attention. Right. Like if you look at um, what's her name, Lizzo. So I was yeah, literally right? going to say so that. Yeah. Like you have these things like she drops a song like years ago. It gets picked up by the movie, then everyone gives her attention, and now everyone's going back to the catalog and seeing what was done. So you always have to think like, um, you know, it might this project might not be seen by everybody, but in five years from now, ten years from now, it, people might look back and be like, "Oh, let me see," because something you did in the future was so impactful. Everyone wants to see your past work, right? So it's always keeping that in mind. It's like today they might not, the world might not be seeing your stuff, but years from now, they might be. You never know how what you do is going to go out there, how it's going to spread um, and what impact that it's going to have. So I think just always being consistent and always putting out your, your best work. So it's not like oh, I need to make sure this gets viewed by so many people. You don't know. It might not be for 50 years that everyone starts seeing it right yeah so it's just like always putting in that best work so always picture it's like okay the whole world is going to see this project even though they probably won't see this one but who knows in five ten years they might be seeing that project so is that going to be something that you're proud of is that something you know you're going to be embarrassed of or, or or what so just always putting it forward and not like how do i game the system and you know, make sure that everyone's going to see my stuff right now. It's like, we, we can't control that. Um, stuff just happens outside of our control. Like I said, once you put it out there, once you put this podcast out there, it's not in any of our controls, whether people listen to it or not. Um, but it might, it might get picked up. It might have a real profound impact or, you know, it might not be this thing that gets out there, but someone who heard it um, was impacted by it. And then something they do uh, you know, gets blown up. And then because they blew up, they point back to this podcast or whatever. It's like, oh, remember that guy? He said this thing. And that was the thing that changed his trajectory. Right. And so it's like, you never just know, like everything is completely, you know, random or uncertain from us. So it's like, we just have to make sure that we're always putting our best foot forward. We're always doing our best work um, in everything that we do. Yeah. I always think of like Billie Eilish posting her first song on like SoundCloud and like, just for her friends and now it's like blown up. So it's like, just like one thing could blow up, but then it could also blow up like Lizzo, like five years later. That's yeah. No idea. Yeah. I think that's a really inspiring thought though, that any, yeah. like it, everything you should just take pride in. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's both, I think inspiring. And then, cause everyone's just always just like, is this going to be the one? Is this going to be the one? Um, but I think, yeah, like you just kind of stay focused on, on what's important to you. Right. Like if it's, you know, if you really love what you're doing and you're doing it for the passion or it's like, OK, I, I genuinely wanted to have this conversation with you, not like, oh, I'm going to talk so that this this podcast blows up and then I get, you know, recognized for whatever. It's like, OK, like and you start doing those things for the passion, kind of go back to like my school days of OK, it's not because this is going to get me a job or something like that. It's understanding what you're passionate about, what drives you, what motivates you. And then when you understand those things, then you can start figuring out how do I monetize this or how do I make this into a career and things for myself. But it all starts with, you know, that that reason why you, what what's motivating you, what's driving you in the first place. Um, and then that way it's like, yeah, hey, you're not going to get as you know, if you're not blowing up, it's just like, okay, well, I didn't release the song necessarily to blow up. Or it's just like, oh, it's being loved by that 100 people. And that that is fulfilling to me. Um, and it's not like, oh, I'm only going to be happy once I reach that that million. I mean, you know, it's beyond, it's kind of like, you know, just life lessons. But, you know, every time that you you think to yourself, happiness is around the corner. Happiness is when I hit this many followers, happiness is when I get that much money or when I have, you know, my names on these credits, um, you know, you get those things and you realize it's like, oh, 
I thought happiness lived here. And then you're just like, you realize it, it doesn't. And so it's like you have those, it's important to have goals and to drive those things. And it feels great to be able to accomplish goals and, and check those off your boxes. But you're not going to find happiness in those things, right? And so it's important to fat ground yourself in, you know, what makes me happy? What what am I content in doing while you're chasing those goals and not get the two things conflated because I think that's where a lot of people get caught up, right? And you hear a lot of celebrities or rich people saying like, you know, and being depressed or saying it's like, oh, happiness doesn't bring, money doesn't bring happiness and all this stuff. And, you know, we look back at them and like, shut up. It's like, come on. It's just like, yeah, you can say that because you have millions of dollars or it's like, you can say that because you have those awards and all these kind of things. But, you know, even in, you know, the successes that I've had or things that I've been able to acquire, it's just like, oh yeah, I, you know, you can really see that it's like, this isn't equaling, you know, happiness. Like there's, they're not directly, uh, correlated. Um, you know, so it's always keep those things in mind and just keep that in check where it's like, you know, enjoy these moments. Because oftentimes it's like, you know, when you're young and figuring it out, a lot of times people look back and be like, no, those were the good years or those were the happy times. Um, you know, when I was still young and free and, and doing all those kind of things. So it's appreciating where you are in your journey. Um, no matter where you are, because at one point you're going to look back and being like, oh, I miss those times or things were cool then, or I, I enjoyed that period. So no matter where you are, there's going to be good things happening to you. There's going to be bad things happening to you. There's going to be things that you've accomplished and there's going to be things that you're going to want to accomplish at no matter what point in your life you look at. And so it's just really about embracing the here and now and just being like, no, I'm, I'm content I'm happy with what I'm doing. Am I doing what I love right now? And then continuing to push yourself going forward. And I think just having that balance and not like, oh man, I, I need to figure out this job stuff. I need to figure out this career stuff. I need to get this money. I need to get this, my spouse or my house or car and like all of these things. It's like, you know, things come, uh, you know, just keep doing what you're doing and not, not base all your happiness in, in, in these things because you'll, you'll never be happy. I think that's a, such an important lesson for emerging, but also established filmmakers to understand. Yeah. Looping back around to representation on screen, I was wondering if there's anything that makes you hopeful or that you're seeing about greater representation in the film and media industry. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we're kind of entering, you know, coming from like a, a, a just for like a, a black perspective, like there's kind of like a, a new black renaissance in film and like a lot more, coming um and so i think that's exciting just over you know my life seeing how much things changed i remember um like when the first bad boys with will smith came out like there was like a huge thing that uh you know this was in the 90s um that the film couldn't get made there's like no you can't have a movie with two black leads it's never going to sell you're never going to be able to do anything and even when they were able to green light it um you know, they gave them no money to, to promote it, right? Because usually they go on tours, they go on all the shows, radio shows, they go all cities, different countries. Um, and they said, like, we're not paying for you to go overseas. Like, it'll never open over there. Forget about it. So they gave them no money for that. And then even in the States, like, they didn't give them barely any budget where it's like they could fly to the different cities and radio stations that do the different promo stuff. They had to take a bus um, all over. And it's just like, yeah, because they didn't want to fund these things. I thought it was just, you know, throwing good money after, after bad. Um, and, you know, we all see how that turned out. They just had the third one, right? Um, and so it was like a huge, huge thing. So it's like, we've come a long way from that, uh, you know, to like last year or two years ago, Black Panther being one of the biggest highest rating movies of all time and people seeing like, okay, because for the longest time and still, I think the, you know, the idea still exists that, you know, black leads, you know, only black people will go and see those movies. And it's like, that's not enough. It's not viable. And so now they're starting to see, you know, with the get outs, with the, you know, the moonlights and all these types of things, that's like, okay, these are viable, right? And so the economics go along with it. Um, that it's like, oh, these movies make money. Oh, these movies win awards. Okay. And, and people like, want to see this, these people, like experiences reflected on screen. Right. right. And so people are starting to open up to it. Um, and I think just in general, and, 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 you know, I don't think the, the companies are entirely wrong because they're, they're, yes, they, they make assumptions, but they're also following based on 
people's trends. So at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, there was a time when people didn't want to see see these things on the on the big screen, or it's just like, okay, you could just have a black character, just stick him in the background, or he'll be like the the one friend on the screen and that kind of thing, but not the lead. It's just like, you know what I mean? Like people, so I think people's tastes are evolving and they're growing. Um, and so I think that that's really a positive thing to see. I, I, I think, you know, with, um, you know, just a huge cultural phenomenon of, of like a Black Panther and that kind of thing. Um, you know, it is, it's great to see, like at Halloween, you see um, kids of all eight, races wanted to dress up like you know it's not something that that was uh you know a very common thing um you know it's usually the other way around and so you know just seeing that and more and more people opening up to those types of experiences and then the fact that yeah it is it's not just cultural but you know there's good business behind it too that these are valuable that that people are going to spend a lot of money to do these things it's going to lead to a lot more of these types of stories being told um, and, and, you know, opening up. Cause oftentimes it's like, you do have like a black, uh, movie. So like just, uh, just mercy just came out a couple months ago, but it only played in like one or two theaters in Ottawa. Right. And so that's usually the case of, you know, if a movie is predominantly like a black cast or, you know, a racialized class in, in any way, it'll play it at one theater or two theaters in the city. It's not going to open up everywhere. It's in select select things. So we're starting to see more and more of these things grow and, and have like a demand for that. So I think that that's very exciting. And I think with um, just the internet and just the, the ability, you know, the technology and things like that, like people are able to produce great work now um, without major studios, right? Like you can do a great film for very cheap. You can distribute it yourself. You can, you know, do all of these things. So you need less and less of these big systems. And so that gives just access to everyone to be their own storyteller and for things to get out there. Um, so I think it's also just important for us to continue to support these, these smaller voices, right? And just making that, that effort, um, you know, so when those video movies do come to town, I make effort to go to the theater just to be like, hey, yes, we want the more of these movies coming out and that kind of thing. Um, and just making sure and even on, on Netflix is they're putting on more and more independent stuff. Um, you know, just showing the support, giving them, them you know, uh, making, letting them know it's like, okay, the people value this type of content and, and people want this type of content. So yeah, I'm happy to see just on, on both fronts, um, that it's being good business and that more and more people have that desire to see these types of stories. You know, you just see with Parasite being the first foreign film um, to win the best movie of, of the year and stuff. And so, you know, I think people will just start to get more and more comfortable with uh, people, you know, for, for dominant society of people who doesn't look like them or, or talk like them or come from the same way. Um, so I think that's just a very exciting thing because there's so much out there. It's like, you know, you see Hollywood stuff, like it becomes so formulaic. It's like, there's so many great filmmakers out there, storytellers out there, actors out there, but we're so confined because they're so just- So much more than just Quentin Tarantino. Yeah, we're, like we're out just there. trying to make the same move because, you know, it costs a lot of money. So they're trying to mitigate their risk by just saying, okay, if I have this director attached to the project, I have this actor, I have this content, this type of storyline, okay, I know that works. I can safely put in this many millions and expect this much out of it, right? So it's just, it's the business. And it's like, yeah, I, I totally understand that. So it's like, as, you know, all these people start rising up, disrupting that system of, oh, what makes a good, you know, uh, like an Oscar worthy picture? What makes a good, what breaks the box office what has cultural impact as that starts to change they're going to have to change their business models accordingly and we see that shift like i said you know from bad boys to to black panther how much of a change that is um in just you know 20 years absolutely and my final question for you is is there anything you're working on right now that you or anything you'd want to talk about um that you want to share um yeah, well, I mean, we're always working on lots of stuff. Um, 
because I, I get probably different than most of your guests that you have on. I don't make films, so we do vid videos for businesses. So we always have dozens of projects at, at any given moment. Um, we work with a lot of tech companies. Um, so we're doing a video right now with like Shutterstock, um, you know, I work with the government, ESDC, doing something with the United Nations, um, High Commission of, of Refugees. Um, so we've got, got a lot of great projects going on. We did something very unique um, just this past Friday, actually. Um, so uh, an executive from Shopify, they, they wrote like a bunch of sonnets. They went out to the desert for a month um, and he, he wrote a bunch of poems. And so we made all of these animated videos for these poems. And we had like a big poetry night at the NAC on Friday. So he invited uh, like 400 of his closest friends and <laughs> rented out uh, yeah, one of the theaters there. And so we had, had those on display. So it was really cool just to... You know, it was, again, kind of more of that creative side because we get so caught up in, like, the business and here's a commercial or explainer video, but these are poems, so it just kind of really opened us up to be completely creative. All Like, there was 12 poems and all. Each video is completely unique. Um, so it was just really exciting. And then just also to have that energy, a lot of times, you know, our projects, we do it, we'll send you the files, be like, okay, we're done. And then it's like, there's no fanfare, but here it's just like, it was a big event everyone got to see it. You got to see people's reactions live. So it felt more like a movie release where it's like, I, we got to go there. There was a red carpet. Yeah. We had like the little photo backdrops and everything. So it's like the credits go up, people clapping for you and cheering and that kind of thing. So yeah, it was a, a lot more of a very surreal experience to feel more like a, you know, like a movie than uh, our traditional work. So that was very exciting. So hopefully we can continue to do more stuff like that. Um, we also were shooting like a little making of um, the whole thing. So kind of doing little documentaries. Like I always loved, you know, back to me as a camera, I was always trying to make documentaries and like it is probably my favorite form of thing. Everyone always makes fun of you. I, I watch more documentaries than like feature films or, or shows or anything. So if there's a documentary on something, I, I want to watch it. Um, so yeah, I love doing those things. So it was great just to kind of, even though it was just like a little documentary of us making these things, um, uh, you know, again, it kind of ignited this dormant passion of mine from, from 20 years ago. That's like, oh man. So like, I would love to, to do more documentaries. So yeah, if, if you're hearing this and you're looking for a production team to do a documentary, I'd love to help you out. That's amazing. Yeah. That sounds like such a great Great event to attend yeah, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's and awesome. it's great like to see like what else we could be doing because oftentimes you get pigeonholed. Um, so you know, as a corporate uh, production company, it's like everyone who comes to us is corporate, and I mean they're the ones usually with money, so I'm not necessarily <laughs> mad at that because they 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 pay for things and uh, you know help keep us going. But yeah, I mean as much as if we could get more into the creative side or you know, work on a feature or, or anything like that would be very exciting, you know. So we're excited to, you know, to have the sound stage come into the city or, you know, uh, teaming up with like Algonquin or whoever, um, you know, and, and you guys to see like, you know, how can we collaborate more on the creative side? Um, you know, we have, we have talent, we have you know, some gear and all that kind of stuff, the experience on the corporate side, but seeing what we could do more on just creative, just to, you know, continue to work those muscles. And so, you know, always looking for opportunities and different partnerships and things like that. Cause that would be, that'd be fantastic. Sounds like a very exciting time. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Well, thank you, Nathan, so much for joining us yes, today. Thank you um, very much. It was really nice chatting with you. Appreciate it. That was my chat with Nathan Hall. I hope you enjoyed it. A huge shout out to our 2020 festival partner, Saw Video, for sponsoring the series. For more information about the festival, visit digi60.org. We'd like to keep the conversation going. Engage with us on Facebook at Digi60 Filmmakers Festival, on Twitter at Digi60Fest, and on Instagram at Digi.60. And let us know what you would like to learn about next. I'm Sampe, and I'll chat with you soon.